Good evening, sisters. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacred heart and how he loves us. How he is the word that was made flesh to share in our humanity, to share in all that we are, to purify us, to forgive us, to elevate us, to sanctify us, that we would share in your beatitude. Father, we ask you once again to open our minds, to give us the gift of faith, to know your son more, the gift of hope to seek and trust him more, and the gift of love to adore and worship, to return love for love with your Son. Let us entrust one another to Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Two points of business before we jump in. Would it be okay if I gave a blessing at the end of each conference? A simple blessing. You can stay seated, whatever you like. Um, good. Uh, and second, I think I'll, after the beginning tomorrow, after the morning conference, I'll sit in the confessional for anything that wants to happen. So I'll, I'll bring a Bible there and you just, whatever you like. <laughs> Good. The second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's just jump into it, my sisters. St. Thomas Aquinas in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, I believe it's there, he lists the three kinds of mourning that this beatitude touches upon. The first is the mourning that, of just, again, being a creature, that we suffer, our bodies suffer. There's just a difficulty of living this life. The second kind of mourning is, is the difficulty of the Christian life take up our cross and follow Christ. Some days you just have to cry. It's just not easy. It's not easy life to choose humility, to choose faith, hope, and love. The third type of mourning is about sin. Mourning our own sins, repenting, and mourning others' sins, sort of interceding. First, note how this sort of corresponds to what the first beatitude stirs up in us. The first beatitude shows us that we're just poor. We don't even hold our bodies. And, well, we should mourn that, right? We should mourn the fact that my body parts are not always going to work the way I want them to work my whole life. And my life is finite. The second kind of mourning is when we actually choose to follow the full first beatitude and have riches and honor and contempt, that's going to be difficult. We're going to mourn. And the first beatitude also reveals how there's little or sometimes big rebellions in my own heart. The ways I try to keep my sieve from emptying out. I try to keep my possessions. Right? There's a mourning and recognizing just how much of the old man is still at work in me. Which is to say, my sisters, the first beatitude, again, thinking of it like, like a polyphonic motet. Right? The first voice is singing about poverty and spirit. The second voice comes in. We're mourning. We are mourning. And again, well, there's a sort of, this beatitude pushes us beyond simply just the moderate, the moderate kind of mourning and into this sort of excellence of the beatitude. That we sort of respond by, um, by 
being willing. Well, the, the word for mourning in the Greek, I had to look it up, is the, the mourning of grieving over someone's death. It's the Greek word that's used in the Septuagint when the report of Joseph's in Genesis, Joseph's death is given to Jacob. This is the kind of grief you have over the only, your favorite son dying. All right, so this is a deep kind of like grieving over a beloved son kind of mourning. Right, so once again, Jesus is sort of taking something we have to accept on the natural level and then drawing it out to a, to a perfection that only he could call us to. And just as before the, the challenge of the first beatitude, there can be rebellions in the heart, now there's a second wave of rebellions. Not only can we rebel because we don't want to be poor, but we don't have to, be, we don't have to mourn about it. We just, we just want to be either just, we want to either be comfortable, uh, we don't want, it's just embarrassing sometimes to have to grieve. There's, all, like, there's a box of Kleenex in the confessionals and we hope we don't have to use it this time, <laughs> right? I've learned as a priest, always keep Kleenex around, right? Um, that this morning, um, just, it's not polite, right? And so sometimes, uh, sometimes there's some obvious rebellions. One is to say, well, sin is fun. Let's just keep doing it. I don't think that's probably lingering too much here, but that sometimes happens in New York City. Right? Or, or to pretend everything's fine. You know, um, a sort of despairing kind of way of saying, uh, God just must be okay with me in this position. Right? It's sort of like, I'm just always going to have this, and so why even confess it ever again? Um, and there's sort of a pride there. A pride that if I can't fix it, then I guess God can't fix it either. If you put it that way, it's obviously false. But that, that can sort of be in the heart. There's more subtle forms that we use to avoid mourning. Uh, there's the Genesis 3 one, right? Adam says, she made me do it, right? <laughs> Just blaming others. I would be a really, really patient brother if it weren't for all the other brothers in community, right? I'd be so charitable. <laughs> be very charitable. Or we can hate ourselves, but not out of that sort of true kind of Christian, um, what can be called self-hatred in the good sense, but rather the self-hatred that comes from pride, that doesn't so much hate the sin, but just hates the fact that I couldn't control myself. And it's not so much that I offended God, it's that I offended my own self-understanding and that I'm not the person who's that weak, right? Um, instead of just simply mourning and grieving what I, what I chose to do. And then, and then any sort of form that goes to despair or discouragement or the lie that sin has dominion, right? Uh, one thing I've learned is that sometimes people just need to hear that Jesus Christ is Lord because they really think sin has lordship somehow. And it's like, that, that's not true. Jesus Christ is Lord. And sometimes you can feel weight lifted, right? But this is those rebellions. So like, there's like the first wave of rebellions with, against poverty, and then uh, we're so poor we can't even fight the rebellions against mourning. There's just like uh, sin, right? Just sort of keeps collapsing on itself. And so once again, as you know, we need a savior. Once again, my sisters, you know how he did it. Here, if we had time, we would just read all of Isaiah chapter 53. Oh, let's just read the first couple of verses, or a few verses here. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. and By his bruises, we are healed. That just as Jesus Christ, to save us out of his love for us, took upon the poverty of our creatureliness and our mortality, so he takes upon himself, although he is ineffably happy as God, the pure joy of heaven, the beatific vision, yet he still takes upon himself our mourning, our grief, 
our sorrow. You can see this in his public ministry, the anger he feels at the hardness of heart of those who do not receive him. You see it at Lazarus' death. He weeps both for a friend's death, but also the lack of faith of people who are there. You see it at the Last Supper when Jesus is troubled in spirit, especially before Judas' betrayal. He has just washed those feet, and he knows where those feet are about to go to, right? We see it in the garden when Jesus calls Peter, James, and John to himself, says, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And then certainly we see it on Good Friday itself. We see the the prophecy of Isaiah 53 fulfilled in a way that's both marvelous and heartbreaking. We even have a sense of it after the resurrection. Um, Again, he's perfectly happy, certainly in his divine person, and even in his glorified body, yet he still bears the marks of the wounds. So even if he's not like emotionally sad after the resurrection, he's still making intercession for us. And it's by wounds. It's not just by a night. It's still not polite, you know? It's still not just like a nice idea, like, hey, Father, like, let's forgive them. It's like, Father, here are my wounds. Let's forgive them, right? He still means, he's still sharing in our, in our grief. And then again, when he calls Saul on the road to Damascus, right? As you know, it's not, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting me? Even in his glorified humanity, he is still sort of vulnerable with his people. He still, in a way, is being persecuted in a mysterious way uh, through the sufferings of his beloved. And he even in the, usually we quote the Acts, the early uh, version of this. There's a later one in Acts chapter 26, which we don't usually hear this one, because Paul tells his, his, his conversion stories three times in Acts. And it says, uh, he says, you hurt yourself by kicking against the goads. It's almost as if Jesus is also grieving what Paul is doing to himself. He's like, this is not making you happy. And, and I love you, right? And first, I mean, just to see with St. Paul, Jesus' grief changes heart. Jesus' mourning wins him over, right? Jesus doesn't give him an eloquent argument as to why he should stop doing this. He just mourns out loud, and Paul stops. I mean, obviously blinding him for a little bit helped, and then getting Ananias to baptize him also helped. But that mourning really is the, the repentance that turns Paul's heart. And just as Jesus takes our poverty and blesses it, and he shares with us his blessed, his blessed poverty so too he shares with us his blessed mourning. And in that he offers us comfort. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction the consolation which we, are, we ourselves have received by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also, also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we grieve with Christ, we share in his comfort. We share in the comfort of the good shepherd. Now there's two, th- I want to focus both on how we grieve our own sins and the comfort he gives us in that, and also the comfort he gives us in grieving the sins of others. In, as far as repenting from our own sins, I mean, the first thing to think about is the very proclamation of the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
with the smaller our repentance, the smaller our receptivity to the joy of the gospel. Right? Whenever um, we declare the great mercy of God, that's objectively true. Subjectively, we receive it through repentance. That's the password, if you will. That to receive this great, uh, this great reality of God's mercy is received through repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, St. Paul explains to them why he was so, quote-unquote, mean in his first letter, if you will, that godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. This, this mourning onto life, this mourning onto freedom, Probably the best, well, there's lots of good passages about repentance in the Bible. Um, the one that I think is just almost the most instructive and kind of funny is at the very end of Luke chapter 7. We heard it, I think, two weeks ago in the lectionary when Jesus is over at, to dinner with Simon the Pharisee and then the sinful woman comes in uh, and bathes his feet with her tears. First, Jesus gives the simple story of the, the two people in debt and who loves more, the one who is forgiven a little, the one who forgives more. Simon figures it out, right? The one, I suppose, to whom he forgave more. And then Jesus says this, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wept my feet wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint me, anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. This is a sort of very stark contrast between the polite Simon the Pharisee who wants to be acquainted with Jesus, who wants to be next to him, who wants to have a polite meal with him. And then the woman who comes in and just sort of wrecks the whole thing. But who do we want to be? Do we want to simply just be next to Jesus and be polite with him? Or do we want to win his heart? Do we want, right, like, like he's, um, Simon must have been very put off by the whole thing. He was like, I thought I had a nice teacher here for a nice meal, and it was going very well, right? That to, to, to sort of captivate Jesus Christ it's best just to cry on his feet, right? He doesn't want polite conversations. <laughs> He'd rather have you, like, I imagine there was snot too coming out of her nose when she was crying, like a really, like just really inappropriate, right? But she wins him. She wins the heart of Jesus. And that's the comfort Right? Would I rather have the comfort of being sort of self-satisfied and publicly res respectable and be able to tally another respectable person who ate dinner with me and like, oh, that was jolly good. I guess it has to be English for me in my, in my head. Or, or do I want the comfort of, of that physical contact with Jesus, of that heart-to-heart -heart contact with him, uh, of the sort of contact where it says... You are my everything. You are my one possession. We also can think of how we are to mourn the sins of others. And certainly there is a joy in exercising mercy, but we'll talk about that later. There's a joy in being pure of heart talk about that later, the joy in making peace. But just in mourning, the, the way I would 
put it is, again, to go back to Gethsemane, Jesus calls Peter, James, and John to keep watch with him. He's very sorrowful. Stay here and and keep watch. Stay awake with me. There's sort of a um, a back and forth here. With, with, With the sinful woman crying, Jesus shows his love by sharing in her grief and welcoming it and surrounding it with his love. Now he asks us to sort of return the favor, to be with him when he is in grief. The first thing to say about this is this is a high form of love. Um, I've lived, obviously, with men for a long time. It's not, I have not yet been close enough to a man to do something like this. Right, like I get along well, very well with Father Sebastian, but he's not going to say, "Father Joseph, I need to cry. Would you stay here with me?" I think men may ask a wife to do that. They, I don't know who else they would ask. Maybe their mother. They would ask their mother. Like I think those are the only two people a man would ever ask, right? Uh, and this is what Jesus is asking of Peter, James, and John. He's essentially saying. I need to cry right now. My soul is sorrowful even unto death. I'm going to even like sweat blood. And I just want you to stay with me. This is something that's so intimate. He doesn't ask the crowds, doesn't ask his disciples, doesn't ask all the 12 apostles, just three. And while certainly on the basic emotional level, it's kind of awkward when someone invites us in to like a cry session and their own sorrow, especially, especially when the sorrow that he knows he's going to die and he's like confronting the whole weight of human sin. There's sort of like on the emotional level, there's a simple sort of repugnance to it. But there's also this deep intimacy. This deep intimacy, would you share in my suffering? We know what the answer should be. We kind of hear it from Paul over and over again in Colossians 1, right? I, I make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, and he says that with kind of a zeal behind it. You also hear it in Philippians 3, what we heard last night. He wants to share in Christ's glory and his suffering and his death to attain a resurrection like him, right? But on a basic level, most of us probably fall into either side of Peter's choices that night. Either we want to just pretend it's not happening and fall asleep, or we want to take out a a knife or a sword and take care of business. Like, who is making my Jesus upset? I'm going to cut off your ear, right? (laughs) And Jesus is like, I want you to be with me and to mourn. I want you just to be present. That's a very difficult balance. We have that, because it's the fight. Peter is doing either the fight or the flight. And Jesus is saying, just remain and keep watch. Remain and keep watch and share in my sorrow. Right? That sort of holding back from fight or flight will make more sense when we bring in meekness, when we bring in making peace into the whole harmony. But even just right now, just that poverty, I don't have the riches it takes to fight all of Rome. I don't have the riches it takes just to solve Jesus' problems. I just keep watch with him. I just keep watch with him. And so let's conclude by once again turning to Our Lady. Here we think about how uh, 
uh, if the word for mourning was used for Jacob's grief over just the reported death of his beloved son, we see Mary's grief really fulfill this beatitude, her grief over the true death of her true son. And that her heart would not be consoled by lesser things, that's part of this grief, right? It's not one that we can just, you know, have a cookie and be okay. It's something that will not be, um, will not just be simply put aside. Her one consolation is, is to hold his body after the crucifixion, to hold his body and to believe, to hope and to love him. And that while we find so many of our own rebellions coming from Adam and Eve and our heritage from them, she, the new Eve, did not rebel. She did not turn to anger or accusation or to discouragement. For those would only draw her attention away from her son. Her one focus was Jesus, was to believe him, to hope in him, to love him. She simply grieves. She simply cries. And she trusts in the Father's providence, in his care, in his plans for the world's salvation. She hopes, she trusts that her son will conquer the grave. But this hope doesn't do away with tears. Rather, it allows her to simply cry, a, a trust that, as Psalm 62 says, right, she pours out her heart to the Lord, trusting that he who will conquer the grave is already there with her, knowing all that is in her heart. In a particular way, let us ask Our Lady, Our Lady of Sorrows, to intercede for us, especially to intercede for those who are not yet convinced uh, that they need to repent, not yet convinced uh, of the joy of repenting and believing in her Son, Jesus Christ. And so, my sisters, if I can give you my blessing, the Lord be with you. Heavenly Father, bless these, your beloved daughters. Grant them a share in the heart of Christ, that by faith they may know him evermore, his poverty, his mourning, his beatitude. And by hope that they would seek him above all things and trust in him. And by love, Father, that their hearts would be perfectly united to him, to his heart the praise of your glory. And so, my sisters, through the intercession of Mary, St. Joseph, St. Dominic, St. Catherine, all the Dominican saints, Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>